Hello, Sipsy Pals. Yeah. I do better that way. Thank you. You guys look awfully serious. How are you doing? You okay? Good. All right, that's better. All right, no, 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 it's okay. All right, all right, all right. Hey, thanks for coming. You having a good week? Yeah. You guys. Yeah. <laughs> These are the guys I'm going to pick on. I know that already. <laughs> you know, they say that Sipsy audiences are very intimidating audiences, but they might be. But you know what's really, but I don't find you folks that way. I find you just one of the most loving audiences to work with, so thank you for being here. Um, I'm just delighted to be here. By the way, I, I live in Buffalo, and, and I travel a lot, and when I travel around the country, I tell people that this is what Buffalo looks like this time of year. Yeah. And if you'd like to get a postcard of this, that is available in the hub to say, here's Sipsy, and I was at Buffalo this year. Not buying it, are you? All right. Hey, we're going to spend about an hour and 15 minutes together tonight. And I think it's real important that you get a real good idea of what you're going to get as a result of our time together. So what you're going to get as a result of our time together is I'm going to introduce you and give you some practice and a process that's designed to help you to become deliberately more creative. What you're learning already. We're going to take a look at some tools to help you apply creativity in teams and in organizational settings. And we're going to look at that particularly from the focus of the leader. Now, whether you're leading a multi-million dollar organization, a church group, a community group, teaching a class, or you're a parent, these methods and these techniques will help you to do that better. And we're also going to take a look at some tools to help you to evaluate and to build some ideas for action because coming up with ideas isn't enough. It's also crucial to be able to sort and to define and to, re and, and to refine and to develop those ideas. Now, this program is similar to some of the work that I did uh, last year in the pre-conference session, um, but we're building on that. So if you've seen that, this is going to be similar to that. Also, I realize that there are some creativity ninjas out there. Yes. Wax on, wax off, watch eyes. All right. And so as creativity ninjas, please do me, do me a favor and do the people here a favor. Support the learnings of others. There are some creativity cliches in here. You might know how the story is going to turn out. So don't say, hey, Paul, he's going to say this next. Are you ready for this? All right. <laughs> no, don't do that. All right. So look for the learning behind that. And also look for how it's being presented so that you can go back into your organizations and do this as well. Now, I have a commitment to you tonight, and my commitment to you is the possibility of you applying your creativity in your world to create results. Now, in that commitment, there's a couple of assumptions. One of those assumptions is that you're creative. And what we know about all of us is that we create, we solve problems, we move on opportunities, we accomplish goals. But we create in different and valuable ways. Now, some of us prefer to come up with ideas that are totally outside of the box, and that's certainly creative. Whereas others of us prefer more incremental improvement, making a system or a process or a method or procedure safer, faster, more efficient, more effective. That's creative as well. And the other part of this commitment is a focus on results. Creativity for creativity's sake is great, but face it, folks, we need to create some results, and we need to create some results in a much shorter period of time than any of us have been asked in the past. And so that's where we're going tonight. Now, how are we going to get there? I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. I'm going to ask you to participate a lot. And I want to emphasize that there are no right or wrong answers. And to back that up, I want to give each one of you a mistake quotient. Each of you tonight has at least 30 mistakes to make. Right? And if you make 30 mistakes, I'll give you 30 more mistakes to make. Breathing sighs of relief already, all right? Because we believe that creativity and innovation and learning flourishes in an environment that says it's OK to make some mistakes sometimes. It's OK to try some new things. And if you're not making some mistakes, you're not making any discoveries. So for the rest of our time together, at least while you're with me, you're safe. You're safe. Right? Now, as Suzanne mentioned, part of my time I spent as a researcher at a university, and I, and I like statistics. And so I need to give you folks a statistic. It seems that the American Psychological Association did a study a few years ago, and they did a study on what people like you are doing while people like me are giving seminars and speeches and workshops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, what they found was about 18% of you are really listening to me. Yeah. And another 25% are having erotic thoughts. <laughs> that group right over there that kind of flips over there. Right? <laughs> wow, what was that? All right. Now, I usually don't worry about that 25% because if you're not listening to me, you've got a great place to go. All right? <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit more than 25 tonight. <laughs> 
let's see, 18 and 25, that's only about 43% of you. What about the remaining 57%? Well, what we think you're doing is a thing that we call in and out thinking. Now, in and out thinking takes advantage of the fact that you can actually hear and comprehend between 900 to 950 words per minute. However, most of us are really only able to speak at about 150 words per minute. Now, because your mind thinks faster than most people speak, you're really only fully attentive during the first 13 to 18 seconds of any presentation or discussion or conversation. <laughs> think about that the next time you have to make a presentation, right? And then you fade out and you might think about, well, uh, how you need to get your car washed? <laughs> Or uh, where are you going to go to pick up that special wine for dinner, all right? Or if you're like most of us, you begin to think about what's waiting for you when you get back to work. Sorry to remind you, all right? All right. Ooh, all right. Oh, oh excellent. You're practicing your hisses. Very good. All right. Well, I'd like you to take advantage of your in and out thinking this evening, and I'd like you to take a few ideas away from here with you, if you would. So would you take some paper and a pen or a pencil, which many of you have already, and if you don't, borrow some from your sipsy pals there, all right? And divide that sheet of paper in half down the middle. On the left-hand side, I'd like you to jot down any notes about the presentation that you'd like to remember. That's your traditional note-taking. Now, we've already provided you with a little briefing sheet this evening. It's this, um, is this yellow? This yellow sheet of paper, all right? It's, <laughs> and it's called, was it lemon? Oh, goldenrod, thank you very much. Good, 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 all right. Um, that's called Leading on the Creative Edge, Points to Remember. And that contains most of the things that I'm going to be talking about this evening. Now, hopefully, we're going to be discussing some things this evening. You're going to be experiencing some things that might not be on that briefing sheet. And that's what the left-hand side is for. With the briefing sheet, you can just highlight some things. So what about the right-hand side? Well, that's for any ideas that come to mind. That's a reminder of something that you need to do when you leave here. That's a phone number of somebody that you need to call. That's a totally unrelated thought whatsoever. Of course, we know what the erotic thinking group will be doing over there, right? <laughs> And people say, write down those out thoughts even if they're not related to the presentation? And the answer to that question is yes. Because if you look at the history of creativity and new ideas, what it is is it's the bringing together of different ideas and different concepts from an entirely different perspective in a new way to create a new connection. And those out thoughts, those unrelated thoughts, if you would, are excellent sources for new ideas and for new insights. Now, the interesting thing that happens is as a result of doing in and out thinking is that your concentration actually increases because you're not trying to remember those out thoughts anymore and you're also not punishing yourself for daydreaming. And what we know about how your magnificent brain works is it actually takes more energy for you to force yourself to stay in and to punish yourself for daydreaming than to allow yourself to move in and out, than to allow yourself to multiple process, than to allow yourself to make connections. And making connections is the essence of creativity and making connections is the essence of learning. So any notes about the presentation on the inside and any ideas that come to mind, reminders of things you need to do when you leave here, a phone number or something that you need to call on the outside. And in and out thinking is designed to move you from the remembering phase. Boy, I've got to remember to do that. I've got to remember to try that. I've got to remember to call that person to the generating phase, generating new ideas and new concepts. So one tool to help you to become deliberately more creative, particularly in meetings and situations like this and through the rest of the week is in and out thinking. Okay. So what is this thing called creativity anyway? Here you are at the Creative Problem Solving Institute, so what are you studying? All right. Well, back in 1961, a gentleman named Mel Rhodes set out to find the single unifying definition of creativity, and he couldn't do it. But what Rhodes was able to ascertain of about the 60 or 70 different definitions that were out there on what creativity was, he found that those definitions centered in four overlapping quadrants. Now, there are definitions out there about what a creative person is. Psychologists were studying creative personalities. There are definitions out there about what a creative process is. Alex Osborne, who founded this organization, we're doing a lot of work in the area of creative process. There are also definitions out there about what a creative product is. How do you know if art is true or beautiful or not? Or how do you know if a product or a service is going to work or it's going to sell or not? <clears throat> and finally, there are definitions out there about what a creative environment's like. What's the environment like in which people are going to feel most likely to contribute their ideas, to get involved in the life of the organization, to make the organization's initiatives their initiatives? Now, Mel Rhodes is into P words, so we call the environment press. Right? Now, we're going to build on the fact that each one of you here is a creative person. We're going to take a look at some process methods and techniques, and that's what you're learning a lot this week to help you to create some more effective products or outcomes, whether they're tangible or intangible. And we're going to work with an environment that supports that creativity. And that's what the mistake quotient is about. And that's one of the unique things about SIPSI is because this environment nurtures creativity, because it has that environment of deferred judgment. So it's no surprise that you're going to come up with some very extraordinarily creative ideas here. Now, 
When we talk about the environment for creativity and the role of the leader, there is some fascinating information out there from a gentleman named Joran Ekfall in Sweden who's done studies on leadership and creative behavior. What Ekfall has found is this. He's found that 67% of the statistical variance accounted for on the climate for creativity in organizations is directly attributed to the behavior of the leader. Now, what that means is, if you're the boss, and in your organization, people are invested in their work, they're contributing ideas, they're successfully moving initiatives forward, there is a 67% chance that you are doing some things right. If, however, the opposite is the case, people in the organization are not involved in the organization, they loathe their jobs, they think your company is a wretched place to work, there's a 67% chance that it's your fault. <laughs> so we're going to give you some tools to deal with that tonight, all right? Thank goodness, all right? Now, there's some other definitions out there about what creativity is. Some people like to make a difference between creativity and innovation. Some people say that creativity is getting the idea and innovation is doing something about it. But one of the definitions that I like is this one. It's just really simple. Creativity is novelty that's useful. Novelty that's useful. And one of the reasons why I like this definition of creativity is because it really expresses the essence of what creativity is. We all agree that for something to be called creative, it has to be new or unique or novel. But face it, folks, it also has to work. It also has to produce a result. It also has to solve a problem, even if it's a producing a result only for the creator. So a working definition for creativity this evening is novelty that's useful. By the way, that's your creativity theory lesson. Right? OK. Well, with all the research that we've been doing on creativity, and with all the work that we've been doing on creativity, there are still some things that tend to get in the way of our creativity. And this is one of those things, habits, habits. I'm going to say a word, and I'd like you to say the first word that comes to mind. Are you ready? OK, this is yes, this is no, this is I'm unconscious. Right? Good. Thank you for being honest. Good, all right. <laughs> yeah, the word is salt. Excellent, superb, nicely done. OK, good. How about this one? Table. Chair. Excellent, very good. <laughs> salt? <laughs> Get back to you afterwards. OK, good. <laughs> Day. Superb. I took that slide. What do you think? <laughs> OK, I'd like you to try this for just a second. Would you put your pens and pencils down? And would you just clasp your hands in front of you? And now, would you notice which thumb is on the top? Which one, right? Left. Left. Good, we have controversy. Excellent. OK, good. Now, would you completely unclasp your hands? And now, would you reclasp them this time with the opposite thumb on the top? Yes. Oh, weird. Yes, OK, good, all right. Well, if that doesn't feel weird, let's just try this. And would you just cross your arms in front of you? All right. Nice and comfortable, just kind of easing into the evening. Yeah, OK, fine. Would you notice which arm is on the top? Yeah, which one? Right? Left, good controversy once again. Excellent. Now, would you completely uncross your arms? And now would you recross them this time with the opposite arm on the top? <laughs> we have a past Sipsy participant here. There he is. Uh, he's a little formal, but he's still walking around like that. OK. Let's see, we've checked your word association, we've checked your motor coordination, let's check your addition this evening, okay? Are you ready? Okay, good. I'm gonna put some numbers up here on the screen. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to sum those numbers together in unison out loud, okay? Can you do that? Okay. All right, good. Here's the first number. Oh, well, that's nice, okay, but come on, everybody together, come on. Now like you really mean it, come on. Now with some spirit, come on. Good. Add this number to it, please. 2,040, 2,070, 3,070, 4,090, 5,000, Excellent, excellent. Ooh. Little controversy over that one, yeah? I heard 5,000, right? Right. <laughs> Thank you, creativity ninjas. All right. Oh, you've got 29 more mistakes to make. Would you agree that that is the correct solution to the problem? Yes, no, maybe. OK, let's just work it out together. All right. Last known piece of data that we all agreed on was 4,090, right? If you add 10 to 4,090, you get 4,100, not <laughs> 5,000, all right? By the way, you have 29 more mistakes to make, all right? So hey, what did I do to you? I tricked you, yeah, what else did I do? I sucked you up, yes, I sucked you in, right, I set you up. 
In less than seven seconds, I got inside of your head and I set you up into a pattern and you expected to increase by a thousand each time. And when a novel piece of data came in, that 10, you made it fit the pattern. Now, I'm not gonna tell on you folks, but I will tell on a few other folks. Heads of Consumer Products Group all say 5,000. Automobile manufacturers in Detroit all say 5,000. Deans of colleges and universities argue whether it's 6,000 or 7,000. <laughs> and then they debate the philosophy behind that. All right? Well, I don't know, Dr. Firestein, what base were you working in, all right? There's only one group of people that this doesn't work on. Who do you think it is? Yeah. Accountants, accountants will bet their calculators it's 5,000. Who else? Yeah. Kids, yeah, about fourth graders. Are too busy, add the one, carry the five, 4,119, all right? <laughs> They haven't developed, one, the habits that allow us to be very, very efficient. And also the habits that allow us to fall into traps sometimes. And one of the habits that many of us have is to take the first idea we come up with and run with it, even if we run right off the edge of a cliff sometimes, because having a problem is so uncomfortable for us. And what we've been taught as good students, as good employees, as good managers, as good parents, as good leaders, is that, you know, there's usually one right answer for solving a problem. And the quicker you get that answer, the smarter you are. But I'd like you to consider the possibility that it might make a lot of sense to come up with a number of answers for solving a problem, then you can pick the best one. I'd also like you to consider the possibility that sometimes the problem you're given isn't the problem at all, and it might make a lot of sense to begin to redefine that problem. Now, you're learning that this week. You're learning how important it is for problem finding. You're learning how important it is to challenge your definition of the problem. And you're also learning how important it is to generate lots and lots and lots of ideas and to, ver to defer judgment when you're generating those ideas. But just to back that up just a little bit, as you came in, we have a couple, of, uh, a couple of articles here. One article is called, After Review, What You Think Is the Problem Probably Isn't, and that's just sort of designed to remind you of challenging your definition of the problem. And uh, the article, There's Plenty of Ways to Jumpstart Creative Juices, that just talks a little bit about generating ideas and brainstorming guidelines, those sorts of things. Okay, so how do you deal with a habit that's not too effective for you? How do you deal with a habit that's not working for you? Well, my psychologist friend said that the best way to deal with a habit that's not working for you is to replace it with a habit that is working for you. So next time you have a tough problem to solve, I'd like you to consider, if you would, some creativity habits. Some creativity habits. Ask yourself, how else can I do this? Ask yourself, what if? Ask yourself, how can I use something that doesn't fit with this at all? How else can I do this? What if? How can I use something that doesn't fit with this at all? And the bottom one, how can I use something that doesn't fit with this at all? It's back to the essence of creativity, which is bringing together different ideas, different concepts from an entirely different perspective in a new way to create a new connection. Okay, so why use creativity habits in the first place? Well, as the philosopher Socrates was once paraphrased as saying, when you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. Now let me just run that by you again, all right? When you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. Now, if you want to change what you're doing, you have to change the way you're doing it, right? If you want to change some ways in which you're leading your organizations or teaching your classes or working with your people or getting your people to grow your organization through innovation, that might be some reasons to use some creativity habits. By the way, if this one doesn't work for you, I'd like you to try this one on for size. The definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. Well, I don't know why we're not creative. We're not doing something different, are we? Okay. So, so far this evening, we've talked about some personal creativity techniques. We've talked about how important it is to make mistakes when you're learning or trying new things. We've talked about in and out thinking, a tool to capture ideas and meetings and situations like this. We've talked about some definitions of creativity. We've also talked about the role of the leader in helping the organization to become more creative. We've talked about how habits might hinder our creativity and how they could help our creativity.